Welcome all you Zoomies to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Tonight we have streamers by Mike Kelly, the Corn Buck, and the Mormon Girl. And before we leave tonight, we'll have a special tip for all of you. Hi, we're the BT's from Boise, Idaho. Tonight we're going to have a fun program with a friend of ours from Nebraska on streamers, traditional streamers. He really got my attention when I talked with Mike several weeks ago about doing this program when he said one of the streamers would be a Mormon girl. I, I can tell you back in the 50s, I was fishing a Mormon girl wet fly, one of my favorites. And for some reason, I don't know why, it went by the wayside as other new patterns came along. And uh, I've tied a few of them up here recently and they went back into my box and they'll probably serve me just as well today as they did back in the 50s. But anyway, let's take a look at the recipes. And for those of you interested in tying this later, you might want to grab your cell phones and take a picture of the two recipes that I'll share with you before Mike gets started. The first one is the corn buck streamer. And you can see the size of the hook is of whatever you want it to be, three or four X long, threads black, tail is red feather tips, rib is oval tinsel, the body is flat tinsel, hackle is yellow as the throat, you got a squirrel tail wing, and you got a thread head. Now we're going to switch to the next one for those of you that want a picture of the next one. That's the Mormon girl streamer. Again, the same thing, streamer hooks, thread black. The tail is golden pheasant tippets, abdomen red floss. The rib is oval silver, silver tinsel, thorax yellow chenille, throat silver badger or grizzly, wing badger guards hair, and the head is thread. Mike Kelly grew up in Nebraska where he became a veteran fly tire as well as a military veteran. After retiring from the Air Force, he now works at the U.S. Strategic Command in Omaha. We met Mike through a veterans organization, Project Healing Waters, where he is a volunteer teacher who teaches fly tying using a digital platform. It's a new method for him, but he is far from a, a beginning fly dresser. Mike became interested in tying more than 35 years ago, learning from library books, then using those skills to duplicate flies that he saw in catalogs. He is particularly fond of using natural furs and feather while tying old classic streamers like those you'll see tonight. Let's join us in welcoming Mike Kelly to Fly Tying Friday. It's all yours, Mike. Thanks, Al. Appreciate it. So the first one I'm gonna do is the corn buck. Your focus looks good, Mike. Okay, good. I'm gonna start with, this is about a size eight streamer hook. And I'm gonna use, um, I'm gonna go ahead and use black for this one. <clears throat> We'll start about an eye length back from the hook, from the eye. Lay down a good smooth thread base. So I'm going to go ahead and tie those in. Um, the length is probably would end up being about half a hook shank in length. Now that, Fred wants to go forward, so I'm going to spin my bobbin counterclockwise as you look down on it, and then it'll roll backwards so I can grab those hackle tips. Now, those hackle stems wrapped around the, the shank there, but they're pretty insignificant as far as, uh, as bulk, so they shouldn't show through the pencil body. So I'll go to about right there and then I'll tie in some 
large mylar tinsel. It's gold and silver, silver on one side, gold on the other. And since I want the gold side to be facing out, I'm gonna tie it with the silver side facing me. And I'll put that in my material clip here real quick. And then the rib on this fly is oval gold tinsel. This is a size medium. Now I'll try to do touching turns as much as possible. And then come back forward to the front. So now since I tied that with the silver side facing me, as I fold that over and start to wrap, the gold side will be out facing out. Oops. Slightly overlap each turn and give it a good, good firm pull every once in a while because as you wrap it, sometimes that mylar tends to want to come away on that leading edge and stand out. But if you pull it a little bit, it'll kind of stretch that into shape. You shouldn't have that problem. On a long shank hook, it, you usually end up with trouble toward the, toward the end here. But it looks like, see right there that was wanting to come away. So I'm gonna call that good. Secure that with a few wraps and then cut it off. Now it uses a gold rib as well, but that really, uh, really catches the light. Uh, Mike, uh, uh -huh. there, I got a person here, Jared is wanting to know whether it's okay if he asks a question. Go ahead. I was just gonna ask you how you get that mylar to stay from, you know, to keep from slipping off there, but you, you already answered it. Oh. Right now I have seen, uh, I have heard of people that uh, use, lay down a, a real fine uh, bit of super glue on the thread base underneath. And then as they wrap it forward, if they accidentally let go, a lot of times that'll stay, stay put. It also probably holds it in place a little better. I'm not a big fan of super glue because usually I'll end up sticking my finger to the fly or, um, but I also seem to have a problem with it getting a cloudy residue from the super glue. So I don't like to use it, um, but usually if you give it give it a real good tug, it'll stretch that mylar slightly to the point where, where it won't uh, pull away there. Thank you. So I'm gonna try to give about seven turns, usually seems to be, and that looks like just about seven turns right there. It should be enough to hold it in place. And that's the body. Looks like I tweaked that tail a little bit, but that's going to be okay. Yep, that should be fine. So next I'll tie in the uh, squirrel tail. And uh, sometimes there's some, some variation in, in the, the markings on a squirrel tail. Um, 
you can see here that there's uh, some black banding in the squirrel tail. I've got some pieces that uh, small pieces of an old squirrel tail. And this one actually has um, a really wide black band on that. And that really makes this uh, corn buck look nice because it fades from the black out to the, to the red. And that gives it a uh, good look. But every, every piece of squirrel tail is gonna have a little bit different uh, markings. Now it's up to you whether you want to sack the hair or not. Um, some people like a uh, more natural uh, taper, if you will, of the of the tips um, as they extend out past the body. I like how it looks when it's stacked, so that's what I'm going to do here. So there's quite a bit of under fur and uh, short hairs. Uh, with the tail. So I usually take a uh, mus mustache comb, pull that out of there. So I want the tail to be right at about, or I mean the wing, I want that to be right at about the tip of the tail there. So I'm going to lay that up the way I want it to be. And then I'm going to mark it by grabbing it here with my other hand. <clears throat> And I'll go over the waist bin there. Sorry about that. Clip the uh, clip the ends, and then I'm going to go back here to the start of the thread there. And if you come down at about a 45 degree angle, it'll help you get a good hold on that hair. Squirrel tail is very slippery hair. So that looks pretty good. Get a few more real tight wraps. And a little bit more in front there. You see some of it's walking off the tips of that hair. It's very slippery. But that's giving me a pretty good shaped head. So that looks pretty good. I'm gonna turn it upside down now to lay in the beard. So that looks like I want the beard to be, I don't quite wanna get it as long as if I let, so I'm just gonna basically just cut off those curly tips there. Resituated in my fingers so I can reach it and tie them in in the same manner that I did the squirrel tail basically. A few fairly snug wraps just to make sure that should look pretty good. And then being careful to watch where the back of my thread is, I don't want. Uh, I don't want there to be a, a difference in where the squirrel was tied and the beard was tied. I want that to be a nice smooth line. Finish that up and shape that head just a little bit more. Make sure I cover all those butts. Looks like I've got a few more there. And then I'll whip finish. And cut it off. And especially for these types of flies, I like to use the um, UV resin. Just makes a nice, shiny, uh, clean head. Hit it with a, a light. 
And there's the corn buck femur. Appreciate it, Mike. Uh, any questions out there? Well, I have a question for everybody watching. I want to know if I'm the only one who's never heard of the corn buck streamer before. I had never heard of it. I think it's beautiful. I, I love the fly. Um, There's also a bourbon buck and it uh, has the same red hackle tip tail. The beard is red. It has a silver body with silver wire or silver uh, oval tinsel. And then the wing is white buck tail. So this is the Mormon girl wet fly. That's it. And there's different versions of it, just like every, anything else. I've, I've seen a really old version where it didn't have the uh, palmered grizzly hackle there. It uh, just had that yellow body with a the, with the red tip on the end. And, uh, but most of the versions I've seen of the Mormon girl wet fly, it's that mallard wing, the red tip like that. And the best I've been able to find is that it was, um, it was, it's actually similar, similar to a fly called the professor. Um, that's got that yellow body with a red tip and uh, a mallard wing. But, uh, the Mormon girl is uh, supposed to imitate a uh, little yellow stonefly or yellow sally. But the Mormon girl streamer was basically adapted from, as a lot of the these classic style streamers are adapted from a wet fly. It doesn't look a whole lot like it other than the coloring. And I hope you like red and yellow because here's another one. So this is the Mormon girl streamer. Another beautiful fly. Um, it uses the golden pheasant tippet for the tail. And then the wing is uh, badger guard hairs. And the, a patch of badger hair isn't very expensive. Two or three bucks for a I think it's about a two by two patch. Um, here's the patch that I have. You're going to feel pretty wasteful when you, uh, if you tie this fly with it, because you need quite a bit of this real dense fur in order to get enough guard hairs to make the, uh, make the fly. <laughs> you could probably make a, uh, if you couldn't find the badger hair, you could probably make a pretty good, rendition of it with a gray squirrel tail. I think that'd make a good wing for that as well. Very similar, very similar markings. It even has that white tip. That's very similar. That's what, when the, difference is, the difference is the gray squirrel is a lot stiffer, um, where this uh, badger guard hairs is real soft. And that really moves in the water. Um, I was watching this uh, in some clear water where I could see it and doing a very slow, very slow twitches for a retrieve. Uh, just pull it about two inches at a time and just do a real short strip, 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 strip. And that, that fly would just, uh, that wing was just going crazy. So use the same hook on this. And on this one, I'm going to use a white thread because I've always just tied this with black thread. And when that gets wet, the black will uh, change the color in the red floss. <clears throat> Anytime you're using a floss, floss body, it's better to use white. This is also a 140 um, denier, so it's a little easier to wrap a thread base. I'm actually going to start in the middle. 
to give me a good mark for the where that red body is going to go. So go to where the thread hanging down goes right to the right to the barb of the hook. And then I'm going to tie in the tail. And this uses golden pheasant tippets. I like that material, but it's one of those things that you get carried away sometimes and a little too much on. So that was kind of a tapered uh, ends on those, the way it was cut. So I shouldn't have too much of a bump there. At this point, I'm gonna tie in the rib and the floss. And I'll tie those in. back to the tail. And then come forward again. And then I'm just gonna move it forward just to get it out of my way. I'll set the rib aside here. I'm stroking this floss to flatten it and gather the strands together. It's, it's like silk where there's lots of strands. And I'm wrapping it in reverse, if you notice. And then I wrap the rib in the opposite direction. And that'll give me a more secure tie down when I get to the end. Now you can tie this in at the halfway point, wrap it back and then wrap it forward again. But I usually don't have much trouble filling in a nice body, just like going with one pass. It's easy if you keep those two strands together to overlap a little bit, make it a nice coverage. Now, any, any material that's reverse wrapped, when you're tying it off, your thread's going in this direction, so it actually pushes against it, and you can loosen it up. But with this floss, it's, it's a lot thinner of a material, so it doesn't have as much push against it. If I tried to do that with the ribbing with that oval tinsel, it would tend to push that tinsel away. loosen it up. So now I'll take the tinsel, and wrap it in the normal direction. With this, I usually end up with about three or four turns. You want plenty of that red to show through. We've got a little bit of my thread frayed a little bit there and it's getting in my way. Ends up being about four wraps. Okay. 
Now the front part of the fly is a little more forgiving. You won't, don't have to worry about what's underneath it as much. So if you take that chenille and just tease away some of that chenille from there, you get to the core on the inside. Do a little bit more. And that helps you tie it down without a big lump there. Again, spin my thread. Just wrap that chenille nice and tight and don't crowd the eye. There's three good wraps. And that does the body of the fly. So now with the badger hair, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit if I can here. So to get enough guard hairs, I'm gonna to have to take a pretty good chunk of this You know, clip it away at the hide. So what I've got is this big mess right here. And if you look, most of this is that under fur. So I'm just gonna grab these tips. And then just pull all that mess out of there. And that's actually gonna get thrown away. If you had really large flies, you could use that as dubbing. I've never tried it, but it just seems like a waste to throw that much away. Stack those tips. And I'll do the same thing to measure the wing. I want it to be about that long. So I'll mark it with that hand and go cut off the tips. That should be good. A few more wraps there. And then for the throat, and I want it to be about that long. And I'll tie that in as a throat. I think I rolled that one. Looks pretty good. So now since I still have the white thread, I'm gonna cheat.
take a Sharpie and make my thread black and then I'll fill all that in. And I'll do a whip finish. Looking good, Mike. Looking good. Thank you. Any um, any questions out there from the gallery? Any questions while I glue the head? There you go. Yeah. You could use gold wire, obviously, instead of the oval tinsel. And there's the Mormon girl streamer. Love it, Mike. Looking good. Red says it's two very nice streamers. Well, thank you. Tonight is just a really short tip. It's going to actually be a prelude to what we're going to do next week. But tonight we're going to talk about direction of the of dubbing in the way in the direction that you twist it on the, the hook. We get over here to the materials. And uh, it's we think direction is so important that we actually put the dem, the illustration on the cover of the book. Anyway, so we'll be using some dubbing, dubbing wax hooks. I'll set the thread over at the vise right now. And now I won't be tying a complete fly. I'm just going to be talking about direction. And I'm going to cover something else that we're going to hear a thousand times over the next weeks about crisscross wraps. But for right now, I'm just going to put a couple of turns of thread on the hook to get started, get my thread hanging there. So I've got something for the camera to focus on anyway. And now I want to take a look at something. This is an illustration from our book. Imagine if you will, the right hand arrow pointing from right to left, right at the eye of the hook is a person standing there looking at the eye of the hook. Clockwise then is in the direction of the curved arrow. Going over the top, down under. In other words, going from 12 o'clock towards three o'clock down to six o'clock down below. That's a, a clockwise wrap of thread on the hook. We need to apply our dubbing so that we're applying the fibers clockwise around the strand of thread so that when we make a clockwise wrap, around the hook, the dubbing strand remains tight on the thread. If you go the other way, then it will become looser each time you wrap around the hook. And how do I know this? Well, if you've ever heard me talk about whip finishes before, I did, the, did this wrong for the better part of 40 years, just like I did the whip finish. And I'll tell you how it happened, at least for me. Maybe it's happened for some of you, maybe it hasn't. But when I learned to tie flies, like Mike, there wasn't anybody anywhere around in, in the Iowa farm country to get any lessons. So I learned from a herder's book that I got with my fly tying kit. And in the book, it said, quote, take dubbing fibers, twist one direction around the thread. Didn't say what direction, it just said twist. Well, I was... I'm a left-handed person who was forced to be right-handed in school, so I did it left-handed. And uh, I went the wrong direction and uh, 
for years and years, I would take three or four wraps of dubbing and then I'd have to twist again and three or four wraps of dubbing and twist again. And well, anyway, you kind of get the idea. And it wasn't until we were in Livingston, Montana, about five years ago at one of the shows that across the street from us in our campground was one of the casters for the FFI. His name is Willie George from, from uh, California. Came over and knocked on our trailer and he said, do you suppose I could get a tying lesson from you? Sure, come on over. And so he was asking about several things about hair and we talked about it. And he says, why is the dubbing so darn loose on my, on my thread? So we started digging into it. Anyway, we figured out together that we both had been wrapping it wrong for quite some time. And anyway, I'm gonna just start by applying some wax to the thread. There we go, I'll just make sure that I put the cap back on the wax. Now there's a couple of ways that I can do this. I can just stroke the fibers and touch it to the thread. And as you can see the, let me get it over here so you can see better. There you can see a little bit better. The waxed thread will grab just as many fibers as it can hold. Some instances it'll grab too many. I'll just get rid of those and then add a few more back in. But what that does now is gives me a fairly even application along the, along the thread. I'm gonna switch over here. And now remember, we're looking from the top of the hook down along the thread. And we wanna go from 12 o'clock on top to three o'clock over there. So we're gonna to have to twist in that direction. And that is clockwise in relation to the way we're applying our thread to the hook. If we were left-handed, we want to go the other way, other, other direction. But now let me just start to wrap here, because this is going to lead into next week's presentation. I'm just wrapping on a body. I want you to notice that I'm wrapping the body from the front of the body area to the back of the hook. We're going to talk about crisscross wraps as a very, very important tool in your arsenal of tricks. And this is a lead up to what we'll do next week and many weeks in, a, in the future. Crisscross wraps, when traveling one direction on a hook, go on the hook in the opposite direction when the direction is reversed. In other words, when we wrap this way, they're going clockwise. But when we keep going clockwise, but, but travel in the opposite direction, like I'm pointing here, it becomes counterclockwise. So in uh, essence, I can wrap a body on my hook by putting the body on backwards, just like I'm doing here. And I'm just about to the end of the body area. And now I just come forward to apply my rib. I have a reversed, um, the, same, the rib goes in the same direction as if I had counter wrapped one and forward wrapped the other. Now that's the sum total of the tip today. Of course, we're going to take it a little farther next week when we uh, get into the next next part of it. And the presentation next week is going to be Sherry Steele and some Spring Creek flies. But any questions before we wrap it up for tonight? Oh, we got some done. Thanks to everyone. Okay, thanks to all of you for showing up.